It's like, there's nobody here. Should we? Should we, uh. I'm not. We can add effects. Can we add effects? How do they work? Oh no, it's only like smiley faces and stuff. Uh, do you have to buy them? No, you have to download them by one by one. Fabio is now live in the Designers League. Oh, okay, good. As long as he's not designed. Like, it's not. Oh, hey, there's one viewer. No, look. <laughs> Look at the face. <laughs> it's because I've never done this before. So I've never done it before tricky. as well. Oh, there was someone. He just disappeared. Um, so you can see the messages. Mm -hmm. No. Put a mask. Do you want a mask on? Uh, yeah, all right. Um, alien. Yeah, go on then. Yeah. Wow. This is the, the value of the Facebook design team, isn't it? Oh my god. <laughs> That's like, crazy. I bet they were like costing millions of dollars for that. It's a big team as well. It's a big team, it yeah. Is, yeah. Hello, so we've got hey two guys. viewers. Well, so who's watching? Swipe left to see your viewers. Oh, that's so cool, do that. Ooh, that Video only mode, oh, the other way. Two live viewers, swipe as you click there. No. It doesn't say anything. No. Can we see questions, if any questions come up? Yeah, I guess so. Does anyone want to ask how our day is? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anything else? Um, Hello. The, that leaves you a message. Yeah, let's just write a message. Do you want to write anything? Let's see. Oh, Fiona says hello. Oh, hello, hello Fiona. Fiona. How's it going? Um, perfect. Okay, cool. So I can see the messages on here. Oh, you can see that? Okay, on, yeah. On there. Is he live or do you have to like, um, reload? Okay. I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> I know the photos so much. I just, I've never used Facebook Live that much before. No, I have not. So it's just got me pulling that silly face. Yeah, he's a first Which is, time. Yeah, well. reason enough not to get involved. Um, okay, it's like, kind of like... So I guess, I guess, yeah, this is it. This is our Q&A session. This is Q&A, exactly. Um, so anything, there's anything, no questions any, yeah, anything design related, anything to do with start, being a freelancer, starting a studio, creating very aesthetically oh, pleasing could, work. We, we could show the uh, we could show the, uh, the the studio a little bit, but oh, we could do yeah. Yeah, so like Let's, uh, to the uh, privileged few people watching us. The office. <laughs> That's the office. Let's see. Do you know what that space is from? That painting, I've no idea what that is. No, I've got no idea. Some so Mancunian guy? Flip it back around. I think it's something to do with Manchester, it all is. It must be, yeah. yeah. Oh. Uh, do, 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 do. I'm gonna type any questions. This is so useless, though, like we, Facebook. Should we Come on. Should we waffle? Oh, ah, okay, so we can see the comments there as well. Oh, here we go, it's coming up. Congratulations, this is your most watched video yet. That's fantastic. <laughs> news. Fantastic, yay. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks Fiona for hanging there, I suppose. Fiona, you should just take advantage of this and ask as many questions as you want about yep. anything that's troubling you in the world of design and you'll get the most comprehensive answers because you have 100% of our un undivided attention <laughs> yeah. right now. Okay, so there's no... Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> should, we, should we talk about something and yeah, see, see if that entices people to yeah, watch? Yeah, of course. Um, should we talk about, uh, oh, give, what was, a, actually a really good question is, um, what is the, how do you, how do I, how do you oh, make, you start asking me questions yeah, I have to now. start you asking you questions if no one else We've is. got five people now, so okay, careful what cool. you ask. Okay, so how, uh, how do you personally create new aesthetic design styles? New yeah, oh, okay. That, that's actually that's, that's a good question. It's a good question because I was asked uh, that question uh, already uh, yesterday. Was like someone else actually asked the oh, same fantastic. question? Yeah, um, and I said there is a kind of rise of very um, kind of like vintage uh, mm -hmm. design. So we were saying about Bauhaus and yeah. kind of like sixties um, revival. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I said I tend to find like new inspirations from books that we buy, yeah. magazines. Um, sometimes it's also good to like just go to the library yeah. and, and kind of like pick up any kind of old How style. How did you identify that was a trend? Uh, what gave that away to you to be able to do that research? Mm, that's a good question. Um, 
I don't know. That's, well, I do know. Um, yeah. You tend to see uh, kind of maybe even on other like dribble trends mm -hmm. is, is always a good um, place to understand the trends. Yeah. Um, I use Pinterest a lot, mm -hmm. so I can see a lot of kind of related shots popping up. Okay. Um, that's, that's strange because Pinterest, the user base of Pinterest is apparently, in the, the majority of it's 35 to 50 old women. <laughs> so it's, that means uh, that our mothers are setting the uh, much, visual, yeah, design the visual trend. design Hey, but to be honest, I mean, it comes from that kind of the era, isn't it? So yeah, like 60s it and 70s. So what would you, if someone, if you had to give advice to someone who wants to create unique work based on current modern design trends, um, and they're seeing and identifying all these cool new features that are popping up. They can see um, these kind of like Bauhaus styles mm. and 60s styles and other bits and pieces which yeah. um, are interesting that they like to work on because they think it's the next, the next kind of like big swing with the industry. Uh, what, do you, what attributes do you look for that would give you uh, that sort of inclination? What do you see? Is it with fonts? Is it with colours? Mm. Is it with the way images are used? Or? Yeah, I think it's a bit of everything, as you said. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be the fonts, it's kind of like the classic fonts. Uh, a lot of like uh, grotesque for the headers. Yep. Uh, sorry, the, the headlines. Uh, and then um, maybe stuff like Helvetica. Mm -hmm. um, and then the style of the design as well. So it's kind of very minimal, uh, clean. Um, and sometimes it's also, it kind of feels all over the place. Yes, so a little yeah. bit like uh, uh, Bruce Lee's design. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, that's kind of like the core essentials of okay. uh, the trend. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we've been working on something like this. Yeah. Um, hi, Lewis. Um, someone else joined. Oh, nice. Are there, yeah. Do questions pop up in that same feed? They or? would, yeah. So we have only got. Oh, perfect. Questions. Well, then I'm just gonna I'm gonna keep picking your brains and hopefully. Someone, no, 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 no. Wait. I mean, can you, you can actually um, explain a little bit as well how you 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 started the design career as well. So I think it's uh, how I started my design career. Yeah, I think that's a good thing. I think it's good. I, I think it's a it might be a, a story for another time. <laughs> it's like a long, uh, a long, long story. story. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna keep picking your brains then. Uh, <laughs> so what would okay. what would be the key, key piece of advice that you'd give to? Uh, and actually we'll give some background to this into why you're, you're, you're the perfect person to answer this question. So okay. you're a completely self-taught designer. <clears throat> I am, yeah. And that came from a software development background. Yes, I'm Matt. And uh, you spent all of your time, um, prior to that, really like, just dabbling with design but not taking it super seriously. Yes. Um, and then all of your time programming. Um, and then through sheer passion and good work, mm -hmm. you managed to work with uh, clients like Riot, Samsung, Porsche, King, yep. uh, Cantas, uh, and probably you know over 200 companies from around the world, including really, really well-funded startups. So what? What? Ne uh, but the problem is that now everything, the landscape's a bit different for yep. new UI designers. So based on your 10 years of experience mm -hmm. and the myriad of work you've done for all of these clients, uh, what would be the key piece of advice that you give to any budding UI designers, up and coming, or? Um, interested in getting into UI design, what would be the key piece of advice that you'd give those people? There is a lot of advice I could give, uh, but well, I think like the key, quick wins, the yeah. quick win is uh, practice. Mm -hmm. uh, well, too much lead. So one is practice, just don't worry about creating. Mm. What should they practice? Uh, uh, so it depends what they enjoy the most, mm -hmm. if you'd be like uh, web design, yeah. uh, iOS design. Mm -hmm. um, my background used to be uh, uh, desktop app designs for Mac. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, iOS designs yep. afterwards. So they kind of, I enjoyed using uh, that as a base mm -hmm. for you know, all, the, all my interfaces. Yep. Um, I mean, yeah, so that's one key piece of advice, just mm -hmm. keep practicing. And the, the second piece is, and we were discussing this the other day as well, is about um, not being too concerned about ripping other people's uh, designs. Uh, yeah, so, um, that's great advice. Yeah, I feel that sometimes when you teach someone mm -hmm. that is new, you know, there's a ways that kind of, yep. Uh, fear of like stealing a lot of uh, design work from kind of established designers, mm -hmm. and I feel that is not. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, um, sorry, Matt. Yeah, I, I don't know if we can record this one. Uh, uh, I did. It, if it can be recorded. Yeah, well. I don't know. Um, yeah. But, but finish, finish your sentence. Sorry. We'll, yes. We'll figure things <laughs> out. Yeah, yeah. I better not watch the, the messages like for a minute. So yeah. So um, 
yeah, kind of like not be too concerned about stealing other pe mm -hmm. other people's jobs yeah. because you're not going to um, produce it for a client yes. at that level. So you shouldn't be yeah, too concerned. Yeah, I highly recommend that. Right. Uh, I think that one of the things that helped me a lot as well was just literally ripping people off. Uh, not ripping people off to use or sell, but just point blank copying work that I liked um, because it helps you figure out not only how to make it but the process behind everything else. Yeah. Um, the process behind like how things fit together, why they fit together. Mm. And as you're doing it, you have to bear in mind that the human mind is really bad at copying properly. So you'll end up adding your flair and your own creative spin to it anyway. And that's fine if when the first time you do that a few times, it's not very good. Yeah. And in fact, if you feel it's bad, then that's a really good sign because it means your taste is good. Because taste is so much harder to train. Right. If you've got um, a good taste, then you'll always try to improve to meet that. Yes. But if your taste is mediocre, then eventually you'll cap off a lot quicker. So yeah. it's kind of finding that balance. But no, I do agree with that. Um, good. I'm just going to... Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Oh, um, no, it's that's cool. That's good to know. All of our places yeah, exactly. Start. I didn't know. Uh, there was a question from by Dan. Dan, how do you strike balance between corporate and creative priorities? Oh, Dan, could you expand on that a little bit more? Um, um, it's corporate business related, as in how we run the studio, or is it uh, creative kind of side projects or anything else? Hey, Jordan. It'd be really good to learn more about that. Yeah, that'll be good. Um, yeah, but I suppose uh, just to kind of like uh, touch on on that before. Um, we get any more information. Striking balance between kind of uh, corporate work and creative work. So I suppose that uh, maybe I'm actually copying someone's work. I mean, that oh, there's someone else. So yeah. Shauna, uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. Yeah, cool. So yeah, Shauna, uh, basically, when a company needs potential play against what you. M Against, ah, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, we can sort that. Let's see, we'll just get to, sh yeah, yeah, so, just take this, so Shauna, yeah, don't worry about copying anyone else's work yep. in the beginning, unless it's client work, um, because if it's client work, then you have to iterate a bit differently. Um, but ultimately, being inspired is fine, is fine as well. Um, understand that if something's good, it's okay to not to steal it and to improve it. Um, if you've got a myriad of sources, then it's not really plagiarism as long as what you're doing is taking all of those sources, curating them and in, like using them as inspiration to improve. Yeah. If you are copying work and sending it to clients, that's wrong. Um, and that's hard, it's hard to get out of that mindset when you first start because once you see something great, it's all you want to make. But that's the thing, once you start to make that really great thing again, um, you'll notice it'll have your own flair on it anyway, so that's not a problem. Yeah, th th um, I'd like to add something on that as well before we answer yeah. uh, Dan's uh, question as well. Uh, is that sometimes when you uh, see some design work that you really like, or maybe like a, a, a collection of designs mm -hmm. that you like to replicate or you like to start, it's actually to uh, have a good look at them and then put them away. So like uh, yeah. uh, you don't get too attached to a particular shape, colour, yeah. you know, design in general. Because uh, your mind will start forming its own connections right. with it. Exactly, yeah. And, and, and if, you, if you have those open, it's very easy to actually go back and say, oh, okay, maybe I can add stuff that are very similar to the original design. Oh, it's uh, Duran Van Eden. I'm a big fan of your work, uh, oh, yeah. Duran. It's great to see you. <laughs> That's um, so cool. Okay, uh, cool. So Fabio wants uh, to take on this. Uh, yeah. Let's let's go for let's go to Dan. Dan's yes. Stuff. So basically, when a company has needs that could potentially play against what you know might be the best creative solution. Uh, okay, that's a tricky one. Um, yeah. Mainly because in so design design is is there's probably two two main sides to design. There's design in the sense that you're designing uh, because you want to create the best possible solution for yourself and for the client, um, and that's the way that it should be 90% of the time. Uh, the problem is that when your when work is given to you from sort of and this is it's not so much true anymore but when you're working with kind of um, uh, f f in different in different pay grades almost I suppose as your pay grade goes up it's easier for you to turn around um, and to without as much of a silver tongue turn around and say this is the best solution this is why and this is going to make an impact to your bottom line and people will uh, listen to you because they're paying you that much money we've had very little problems when people we've worked with large clients and big corporate retainers um, to kind of m m make a change movement. Now that might be because we're very good at explaining why something is good for them, um, especially with a creative direction. And I guess that might be because we know the right words to use. So we always sell it with, this is gonna be better for you. If we do X, it will lead to Y, and that will affect your bottom line, because ultimately corporate clients, they really care about revenue, um, and they care about maximizing that revenue or eliminating archaic processes which 
cause them problems and make life a bit tricky. Um, and then the other side of things is when kind of you've given design work and you have complete freedom, which is um, a little bit rare and you don't really get that from corporate clients as much. So I suppose to answer your question um, as simply as possible, striking the balance between corporate and creative work um, is as easy as your ability to talk to someone. Um, if you're a great creative and you want to create incredible creative work, whether that's uh, logo design, illustration, UI design, or branding, um, ultimately someone already has a vision in their head um, and you can either try and tease that out and improve their vision in a way that you, you feel fine visually pleasing and aesthetically pleasing, or you convince them. And to convince them, you need to sell benefits and you need to tell them why something will make a big impact to them, why it will change their life, why it will improve their revenue, why their users will love it. Um, and you have to use the word you at least three or four more times than you'd use the word I or we. Yeah. Um, because that's the only way they're going to listen. If they feel that you're doing something so great for them and it's going to make such a big difference in the long run that that will never change. Um, but again, an easy hack if you're like not at that if you're not comfortable with that or talking isn't your strong point is to ultimately take their vision and just make it as aesthetically pleasing as possible, um, and to just keep iterating on that. Really, those are the two best ways to do it. And um, there's no hack for that, unfortunately, especially if you're a freelancer or mm. you're working for an agency. You've kind of got to deliver what the client wants anyway. And um, what I would say is don't take on work that you don't feel there's going to be the right balance because you can never use it or showcase it. Yeah. And ultimately, you want to do work to get more work. Um, you don't want it to cut off there. So, um, yeah, have you got anything to add to that? Or? No, that was perfect. I would just say that it's golden advice because when I was freelancing on my own, it was always kind of tricky to get that balance because mm. um, sometimes I, I couldn't be bothered to explain or talk to the client yes. the proper way. So. Um, well, it's tricky as a like freelancer. I mean, you've got emails, you've got invoices, you've got finance, right. you've got marketing, and you have to turn around and convince clients. Exactly. It's, you know, sometimes it, you just do it to pay the bills. Yeah, so I completely and, get and, that. and kind of like your marketing background is like perfect for these type of things as well because you can actually explain better to the client and uh, make them understand. Yeah, I guess yeah. if, yeah, the, the, the rule of three U's is good. For every time you say I or we, make sure you say you three times um, because then someone will feel like you're helping them, not yeah. you. Yeah. Awesome. So, Chukib, um, what's Oh, this is a good one. This is perfect for you. Harley versus fixed yeah. rates. Which one do you prefer and why? Why is he perfect for me? Because we, we never work hourly and you know. <laughs> and got, yeah. And you, yeah. Can, you so, can explain that. Yeah. So, that's a good point because I used to work hourly before when I was uh, freelancing. And then uh, once we started Miklio, then we kind of understood that probably was not the best way uh, because we never get the kind of... Um, creativity, um, like creative freedom um, within those fixed hours. Mm. Uh, I used to work with a lot of agents, uh, agencies, for example, and uh, many of them would constrain me to do, yep. uh, kind of like calculate the time I've worked and uh, it's make like sure a, It's like, like a vice. Right. They, they watch you like a hawk and the creative process yes. can't thrive without, um, I mean, the creative process is, there's a really simple mnemonic to remember it called ISIV, uh, I-S-I-I-V. And it's insight, saturation, uh, incubation, illumination, and verification. But basically what that means is you need to look at lots of stuff, let it sit in your brain, um, let your brain work on it, and then keep like hacking away at it. Yeah. Um, and when you're working hourly, it's the assumption that you're just going to do lots of stuff and you're never going to stop and you're never going to give your brain that time to selectively forget um, and then create these really strong neural pathways that allow creativity to shine and work really well. Um, you never find a lot, any, I, I would say you'd really struggle to find a high level creative that would, or like someone like um, doing really cool stuff that turns around and goes, yeah, I work hourly, mainly because it's tricky to it cost in that time where you yeah. have to say to a client, I'm going to need two hours to go and, you know, go to the gym or I'm going to need an hour here to go and walk around while my brain like fi figures out a solution. Um, and that's a real part of the process. And people think creativity is this kind of fluffy thing that um, there's no science behind it. There's plenty of science, there's loads. Oh, there um, is, yeah. And if you look at kind of like left, right brain neuroplasticity, it all kind of points to um, the way the creative process needs to work to thrive. And you need time to selectively forget stuff. So working hourly really sucks because if someone's watching over your shoulder and watching your back and they yeah. say, hey, um, you said three hours, why, you, why, am I, why, you, why you, am I paying you an hour of time to walk around and go do this? It's like, yeah. you know, because I have to. Um, it's part of my process and that's what matters. So. Yeah, definitely. And we do spend quite a bit of time uh, just researching on things. Yeah, you know, like Finding inspiration. You know. So that would definitely not work for, it's not, a, for people, an hourly people, project. You should always charge people for outcome. Do value-based pricing. What, how much does something mean to someone? 
if someone wants um, a marketing page and it's going to bring them in fifty thousand pounds of or fifty thousand dollars of revenue why should you feel bad to charge a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars for that page when it's going to get 10x return um, it's understanding the value of that and selling the value to the client um, in a way that they'll be happy to pay it because they know what you're doing for them and the ROI that's going to have. Yeah, and also want to apologize about the shaky video. My hand is dying by holding the phone in this position. I don't know if we can actually prop it somewhere. I can. I, can. Um, I don't know. Probably we can stand there somewhere, but uh, is it, I can. Do you want to? I can take the reins. Oh, well, thank you. Me. My hand is like yeah, frozen cool. in this position. It's um, all right. Who's? Uh, uh, let's have a look. So. Thank you. Oh, that's good. So it comes to territory, so develop a clear path to the bottom line. Oh. Okay. Demonstrate best practices. Yes, cool. Oh, do you want to keep doing it? Because I'm going to put my finger in front of the camera. Yeah. Cheers, guys. No worries, Dan. Um, any more questions, let us know. We're always happy to help. Yeah, so it's Jack. Um... What would you say is the best way to obtain a freelance client base? Jack, um, do you have any... When you say freelance client base, could you ex expand on that? What do you mean by client base? Um, are you talking about um, a set of loyal clients that are on retainer? Mm -hmm. or are you talking about just getting projects through the door to start with? Um, it would be good to know which one of those, because there's two different approaches. If you just want to get projects through the door, there's different things that you do rather than kind of like putting on retainer work. Um, yeah. I suppose we could, we could go through both, to be honest. It's not too tricky. Oh, cool, yeah. Ah, oh, just a pleasure, Jackie. No worries, man. Um, yeah, I suppose we could go with both. Um, Freelance client base. So if we, um, if we assume which it's two things, it's clients through the door and it's retainer clients, so an ongoing basis. Yeah, I feel the retainer clients is always the tricky one. It is, yeah. If, even ourselves, we sometimes we struggle to mm. get back to uh, the same clients. Yes. Uh, for, for lots of reasons, mm. uh, even if they're very happy with the outcome. I'd say that the problem with design is that if you're good at design, you will kind of, uh, just getting clients to start with, pal, cool. Okay. Um, Okay, so the easiest way to get clients to start with um, is to, and I say the easiest way, it's not that easy, um, and there's no hack to it. Um, there's two, the two easiest ways to get clients are to one, show your work, yeah. and to show the work in places where you know clients hang out. Uh, this could be, I mean, if I had to name some places off the top of my head, this would be like Dribbble, Behance, Behance. LinkedIn, Instagram, um, well, Twitter to an extent. Yeah, you could see if any hashtags pop up. Well, um, I mean, we've never had much luck with Twitter. No, not really. I've had a few inquiries from there, but nothing like no, major. Uh, not even like Facebook groups or anything like that. It could be interesting, but yeah. when you get like in design circles, sometimes it's designers for designers, mm. and it's a bit tricky to find the client yep. there. But um, there might be occasions where someone is too busy mm -hmm. uh, and would pass along you know, their own clients or yep. inquiries. Okay. So definitely, definitely useful. Um, the, second, the second way um, is to ask. And this, this sounds stupid, but ask people that you know. Ask, um, like if we've got makeshift iPhone stand, adapter thing, you can use an iPhone, works like a charm. Oh my oh, God. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, probably put it in a mug or something. Put it in a mug. Yeah. <laughs> put it in a mug, can we do that? Have you got a mug? Uh, we got the small ones. The fa the we could rest on top of a mug. Uh, or a couple of them. Hmm. Um, I do, but we have to stand there. Yeah. Well, let's answer this question first. Yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah, so to, uh, the second best way to get clients is to ask. Um, and uh, yeah, it sounds crazy, um, but ask friends, ask family, ask people you know um, if they know anyone that needs help with kind of whatever design work you're doing to start with. Um, they're, the easiest, they're the easiest places to go because it's not scary. Um, and it will get you prepared for asking. But ultimately, asking is more than just asking people you know. It's asking other people. It's asking um, companies that you want to work with or people that you've seen um, working or that you've seen are looking for what you can do and saying, here's my portfolio or more than that, asking them what's their problem and how you can help fix it and solve it. Um, that's the tricky thing is that most designers don't look at themselves as uh, problem solvers. They look at themselves uh, or uh, they look at themselves as just creatives that make nice things. But everything that design does, aesthetically pleasing or otherwise, makes a massive difference to a business. Um, and you need people to know that. And you're fixing a problem either way. Uh, if someone needs design and they already know they need design, then all you have to do is say, well, why do you need design? What sparked that need? Because there'll be something that's triggered that. Yeah. Um, and from there, you can kind of help and support that. But ask, yeah, so show your work everywhere where you think clients will be, and then ask people. Ask friends, ask family, ask people you want to work with. Uh, look on a angel list, look on um, job sites, um, and find people that are hiring, full-time designers, and send them an email um, and say, look, you're hiring this role full-time. Um, I know that it's important that your business gets this help and support 
now. Is there anything I can do or is there any way we can work together to fix your needs before you find that designer? Because at the moment, you're going to be losing time, you're going to be losing money, and you're not making the impact to your business that you want to. So is there anything you can do to kind of fix, help, and support that? Um, but that's it. You have to kind of ask to begin with. Uh, and once you've got a portfolio and you're putting work out in the right places, it helps a little. Um, there's things like Crew.co and uh, things like Design Inc. Um, and a few other platforms which act as curated job boards, so you can kind of just go and apply um, for like freelance work and get to kind of build a client base. But the problem with that is that there's a lot of competition. So we, we yeah. even we kind of have a hack on that, and we don't have a lot of luck sometimes. No, definitely. Um, so I'd say ask, ask people, and go and meet people, um, and then show your work as much as possible. Yeah, I agree. It, it takes time, and you'll have to you'll have to kind of walk the streets a little, but it's worth it, yeah. um, and it make, gets easier. The first. Get, finding your first two or three clients is a pain, and after that, it gets loads better. Um, and I, hopefully that answers your question, but anything else, just let us know. Unless you've got anything to add to that. Uh, no, no, that's good. Um, yes, perfect. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's a question from Zach. Yeah. Hey, Nicola. <laughs> uh, so. If the team you're on falls through and you know people who can help, you bring them on. Do you ever charge a fee for this? Um, so are you talking about if... If we're working on a project, we have to bring in a freelancer. Um, because that's an interesting thing. I don't know if that's ever happened. Yeah, um, so let me, let me reread that. Uh, so, if the, so Zach says, if the team you're, you're on falls through and you know people who can help you know, and you, you bring, bring them, them on, on, do you ever do charge, charge a fee for this? this. Um, that's, that's interesting. That is really um, interesting because I'm not... Can you, can you expand on that a little bit, Zach? Can you yeah. say, just let us know a little bit more about what you mean? Are you talking about bringing freelancers in? Are you talking yeah. about if we fail? Um, or just a bit more context? Yeah, exactly, yeah, because I'm not quite sure. I can't tell the top of my head. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like, I brought on a day, dev to this project, who basically said the project, nice, good call. That's, yeah, that's cool. Um, so... It, so w what is about the fee yeah, then? Yeah, so is it would like... be like, would you charge, say that your team, oh, okay. your team, yeah, he's a freelance UI designer, okay. the team he was oh, on, it. yeah, basically cocked up. Right, um, right. And so he's had to outsource the dev work to I, save the project. Yeah, that's a good So that's would, a we good point. Would, would we personally charge a fee to the client for that? Yeah, I mean, we probably would. Um, it depends. It's, it's tricky how you'd kind of cost it in. Um, it's tricky, but it also depends on like the time commitment from Zach, for example. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so if you have to do a lot of uh, um, kind of making sure that the developer is doing the right work and implementing your designs, and you're doing a lot of work on behalf of your client, then I, I feel that you deserve the additional fee that you're going to pay your developer. Mm -hmm. uh, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah, yeah that um, makes sense. So, I, yeah, I, I've definitely it's depending on the circumstances yeah. as well. Um, and also, um, you will not, sometimes, so sometimes you have to understand about your um, client's budget as well mm -hmm. and kind of work around that. What if we um, flip on its head? What if, I suppose, because that makes sense, say, if it's our fault, I'd be less, in, I'd be less right, inclined okay. to charge yeah, the client. So say we fucked up, or the team we have fuck up, and we have to get people in. Yes. I'd be really less, I'd be less inclined to charge the client because it's our fault. Um, yes. However, if the client turns around and it's the client's fault that we've had to bring in external help to fix right. this, then we 100% charge the client before giving them the deliverables. Yeah, just exactly. because it's not fair. You eat the cost of someone else's mistake. If it's yeah. your mistake, um, then you've kind of got to, got to you've got to. Do what you feel is right. If you feel it's right to charge the client at that stage, then do it. Um, we probably, I don't know if we would, because we, we, we tend to eat a lot if, if, we, if we fuck up personally. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, yeah, I mean... I suppose if you're freelance, yeah, it's the latter the, case, yeah. Yeah, because... So if it's, if it's the client's fault, I'd, I'd always kind of Yeah, charge, I would definitely yeah. charge. Um, also yeah. because... It might be easier to eat the cost as an agency, mm. as a freelancer. Is oh, as a freelancer, yeah. If you're losing, yeah. a cut, if you're losing, you know, three, four hundred quid, that's like the difference between paying rent and not paying rent sometimes. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd charge a client and I'd let them know why, um, but I wouldn't make it a, sh a surprise because clients will just lose their mind when they get surprise invoices or they get surprise oh, fees. Yeah. So it's having that open dialogue and saying, look, this has happened, this is fixed. To do this, this has had to happen, and that's because this broke down here um, and you didn't support this. Like, don't get us wrong, 
we understand that this is a pain, but we can't eat this cost. So if you want the work delivered, then um, you're going to have to pay for this. Yeah. Uh, nine out of ten times, uh, as long as you have an open dialogue, it might not be a pleasant conversation, um, but if the work is good, they'll pay for it. Um, it's just making sure we don't burn that bridge as well. If they're not a great client to work with, and it doesn't sound like they are, if it's the latter case, then you'll be fine to do that. Ultimately, I, I would say as well that if they pay for work or they don't, they don't pay for any work that you've created for them i wouldn't be scared to say that's fine but i still own all the rights to this work um, and i wouldn't i wouldn't if i, I wouldn't if I, you wouldn't be scared to open source it um or even kind of like use it um it's like a, if it's like a web dev stuff just throw it as a theme on theme forest to see if you can make some money back yeah um because they you own the work still um for us it's a bit different because we charge in an upfront basis yes um because we don't like playing accountant and we don't like playing credit controller so we charge an upfront basis and we can kind of get away with that because of fabio's reputation um and the fact that we've got a big client base but i suppose in the beginning um if you can't and you have to kind of get paid on deli delivery then mm. just make sure that the client knows it's like you have to pay this it's not getting delivered we still own this which you know it might be uh the it might have the client's branding and stuff on but you can always reskin it and try to kind of recover your loss somewhere else um but yeah any, anything else to add definitely no no um that's a that's a good point i was just kind of thinking about payments and clients and, mm -hmm. and i was thinking even if you're a freelancer just make sure that you do charge something up front always yeah yeah always um, at least half at least at half. least half up front because we've been burnt oh, so many so times. Oh, so many times. We lost uh, in 20, yeah, in 2015, and just around Christmas time, we lost five grand um, yeah. from a project that we'd pretty much already done. Yeah, I agree, yeah. Aaron, yeah. Yeah, always take a deposit, yeah, that kills that. Um, yeah, was, that's happened loads. We worked with a client in India, um, that were, they paid us the deposit, but, uh, and then we, we still managed to, do all the work and then they just were like yeah we're not paying for it yeah this is like a, yeah, yeah and that's why we we kind of started making sure that we do charge uh, most of the project up front yeah. um, a good way to a good way to look at it is to charge on a goal-based method so if, yes. if we're charging a lot for uh, project work for example so say we've got a a i don't know let's make up a number a 10 grand retainer or something um, and we know it's going to consist of branding uh, ui design dev and maintenance then each one of those becomes a milestone and we'll say you have to pay for that milestone up front. So branding will be uh, kind of X and then UI will be X and then dev will be Y. And that's it. We'll kind of say you have to pay for it first just because that way we can do the creative work without being like financial controllers mm -hmm. yeah, worrying exactly. about money because it's not our job to do that. It's not our job and it's the least thing they want to worry about when you want to be creative. You, yeah, you can't be creative exactly. right, if you're uh, struggling with money. Um, yeah. Well, you can, but you'll notice that once you stop struggling with money, your creativity just goes through the roof. Yeah, there's so much stress going on. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you get so many arguments with clients of course, because yeah. you know, late payments and things that's like a, that that. That's a good hack, actually. If any, yeah. any, any, uh, should we go through three habits every single creative should have? Because that's a good, good point, actually. Yeah. If I had to give them, I'll give three and you can give three. No, 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 don't. Oh, my God. It's yeah. seven o'clock. I, I cannot think yeah. All right. that quickly. Uh, you, of course you can. Just think of the things that you do, <laughs> which are really nice. So I'd say, yeah, three creative habits. Three creative that, habits. No, okay. that every single person in the creative industry, no, not three creative habits, three habits that okay. every single creative in the industry should have. Number one will be journaling. I think that every single person yeah, who does any point. creative work should journal. And they should journal because it helps them improve their mood. You've got to ask yourself questions. How was your day? How did you feel? what went well what didn't go well how would you improve yes. and also have a subsection within that in fact i can share my journal if anyone wants it they can see the structure and layout i don't care um but having a section on creativity really helps when was i creative today what did i do to push my boundaries yeah if i have to think in one different perspective today whose perspective would i take so putting yourself in someone else's shoes so if i was bill clinton and i was looking at my day how would that look yeah it sounds crazy but it's yeah. creative right but, yeah but would you go um Oh yes, yeah, so yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah, I okay. can, I can, I can put the questions in a Dropbox link. Or I can just take a page. It's not that personal. Okay, you know, yeah, just share it. Yeah, I don't even know what it looks like to be honest. So yeah, share it with me. Okay, yeah, that's cool. We'd we'll love to see that. But um, it's not short of your journal. Oh, cool. Yeah, maybe yeah, of course. Yeah, that's no problem. Yeah. So um, I was going to say, do you go in depth about the journal side? So do you actually describe a lot of stuff that you've done? My, it sounds crazy, but I probably journal for thirty minutes a day, Seriously? and it sounds it sounds like a oh. lot of time, but I look at it as sweeping the floor. So if you sweep a floor every single day, um, 
you know, it's going to take a lot less time. Okay. You know, if you sweep the floor once at the end of the week, it's going to take three hours. Yeah, because yeah, there's it. tons of stuff over right. that's accumulating. And worse, you're going to trip over that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's going to cause pain. You're going to look at it and you're going to hate it. So I get everything out every night. Um, and it takes a little bit of time, but it means that ultimately kind of all my learning, all my focus, all my like fears, all the kind of like personal crap which builds up disappears yeah. um yeah it, it's a good method i, I do it in so. the morning like i yeah. don't do it in the uh, yeah. evening um but i do like the the five minute journal which yeah I that's really a good one as well it's a good talking one talking about gratitude is good yeah exactly because it's also um you don't have to go in depth you don't have to spend like half an hour typing yeah. if you don't want to do mm -hmm. that i used to use uh, day one for i it. still use day one yeah you do it's okay. fantastic it's, it is fantastic but sometimes i just cannot be bothered to just write anything <laughs> <laughs> you know i just don't have that kind of structure to say okay yeah you know answer these questions and it's because you're not sweeping the floor enough <laughs> yeah um, it's all oh yeah it's the second habit as well so we've got journaling well there is sorry uh, aaron as well function over visual wanna... design yeah oh we can get that that'd be fun uh okay so uh but yeah, second habit. I'll just do three habits then, because this, this saves you this question, because I know that you're, you're struggling. Okay, yeah. So second habit, so journaling. The second habit, and uh, this will, it will be, every single creator should have is getting at least seven hours of sleep a day. Oh yeah, that's a good Anyone point. that, yeah. I mean, I try to get at least eight, but anyone else that, that ha gets uh, less, than eight, less than seven hours of sleep, like assume the next day is gonna be super tricky. It's gonna just be a write off, because your brain needs that time. You know, your body needs that time. It does. Creativity is hard. The amount of like, if we have to look at it from like a really technical perspective, the amount of strain creativity puts on the prefrontal cortex and the neocortex, and ultimately your limbic system takes a bash from it yeah. as well. You know, all your entire body when you're being creative is like working hard. And since the prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that makes decisions, when that's burnt out, if you've not rested, how can you make a good creative yeah, decision? Exactly. Um, um, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I do everything I can to get seven hours of sleep. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm ruthless. Like, uh, I, I try not to eat past a certain time. I have, like, yellow, oh. yellow lights on all my devices. I, I, I know, turn I mean, off as much light. Like, yeah, you know. I mean, if, if you work with Cass or uh, kind of, like, spend most of the time with Cass, you know, like, how strict it is with, like, eating and uh, training and... Everything really, so it's quite. I mean, I'm not as strict as you are, uh, and I would love to be. Oh, you don't like, have to. I don't think anyone has to be strict. Like you could, you could be pretty, pretty, pretty creative on twenty donuts a day if you want. I just think you should <laughs> you sleep loads. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I do. I do agree. So journaling, sleeping, and uh, uh, fitness as well. Like, I'd fitness, say. fitness is good, but it's not for everyone. It's you know, not for everyone. You know, some people a like a little to... bit of like. Uh, it's not for like I, it wasn't for me to be yeah. honest. Um, I definitely think everyone should walk. But I wouldn't say that's, yeah. that that's uh, that kind of. I think that would just come with sleeping more. I think that if you sleep more, you feel feel happier yeah, for it, and you want to kind of walk around a bit more yeah. just because you've got more energy. But journaling, sleeping, and the last one, the last one I'd say is if they've got if you is to just freaking find some is to create a. Oh, this is a really good one. Is to create a themed learning is like a themed learning plan for twelve months. Yeah, that's a really good one. So every single month. Um, so write what you would like to learn and do everything you can to learn that one subject in one month. So for me, I themed the entire year. So from January, February, March, April, May, June, every single one of those months has a, has like a word underneath it. And it will be, for January it was sketching. Um, I wanted to learn more how to do more kind of um, still life and kind of real portrait sketching because I knew it would impact my design, the design process a lot more for me because it would help me understand more about white space, gestalt theory, it would help me um, just see things in a more beautiful way. Yeah. Um, so I bought I, I, I bought sketchbooks uh, and then I bought books to teach me the sketch and that's all I did for a month. And it made a massive impact and I've been doing that ever since. Um, and every single month I've learned something new which has changed the way I think, shaped my brain in a new way, so neuroplasticity. And it's connected old pieces of information with new ones and suddenly I've learned loads. Mm. Um, so yeah, those are three, three, they're three habits yeah. all creatives should have. They should be I willing agree. to journal, sleep well and then theme what they want to learn. Yeah, and the then just tunnel into one thing work just one month at a time, get super deep, um, do super cool stuff, um, learn that. And then the thing is, I don't n know enough about sketching even now, which means that in another month's time, like for next year, I might repeat the same thing and yeah. learn loads again. Yeah, exactly. Um, like I've learned to do branding, illustration, um, and admittedly I I'm lucky because I had, I've got a lot of resources with the studio and stuff, so we could pay like really, 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 really like respected Dogo designers and illustrators to teach me and stuff as well, yes. as well as books. But 
you know, just going out there and just freaking learn, like grabbing books, learning, practicing for a whole month makes such a big difference. It does, yeah. And, and, and that's a good point as well because if you structure your learning, it makes it so that you don't jump. From, like, for example, my problem was that I used to jump a lot from like one technology to the other or like, oh, I want to learn how to code in like JavaScript. Mm -hmm. I want to learn like 3D, 3D modeling or whatever. Yeah. And if you don't have that kind of structure, then you would be jumping all the yeah. time between different things. Yeah. Uh, and you never finish anything. Yeah. So having that kind of like nice structured learning uh, plan, it definitely helps. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, hey, Matt, and oh, thanks for the kind word, the kind word Ben. Oh, kind words, Ben. <coughs> <laughs> Hopefully that's been of some use to some people. Yeah, so there was uh, a question from our Function well. over visual design, 60-40. Ooh. <laughs> that's, Ooh. Uh, <laughs> I know, functional and visual design. I'm going to um, let you say, to take, have oh, your take on this first, yeah, because a tricky one I, would, I, I think we, we're very similar on this, but we are you were going to explain right, better. Okay, yeah. so I will explain the visual design importance uh, if you are to showcase something. So th this works a lot when you, when you work on a project with a client and the outcome is not what you expected. Or maybe you design something really cool and the developers messed it up, so you cannot showcase it because you're not very proud of the results. And I feel that kind of like visual design kind of, um, um, you know, remaking the design or kind of posting the design with the original style would help a lot getting a lot of like likes and views and things like that and uh, attracting new clients. Uh, but yeah, so function of a visual design, uh, I don't know, I mean, you can add something yeah. else. So uh, I'm, I'm, I kind of went... Uh, no, 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 it makes sense. Side. Okay, so function of a visual design. So if I had to be brutally honest, I would say it should be 80-20 with the focus on visual rather than function. And now the only reason I'd say that is because function... Oh, people really heavily over-engineer things. So... Uh, it's tricky because UX makes a lot of sense to us because yeah. we're self-taught with it. But for experience and function with something, um, ultimately, to an extent, it's common sense and I feel that there's diminishing returns. So if you spend 60% of your time on the function, you're unlikely to get 60% of the results that you want. Um, people are very visual creatures. Uh, if we, they're, they're, and there's tons of ways that you can kind of test this on yourself. So if you want to remember or learn something, for example, instead of thinking in words, think in images, and suddenly things stick a bit better. So if you wanted to, um, <laughs> if you want to remember, say, the Japanese word for, is it, see, see you later, is matane. Matane, right. yeah. So if you, matane means nothing um, as words, but if you suddenly break it down into a mat with a tan on Annie, like, that's a funny image. There's, oh, your friend Annie is sitting on a, there's a mat with your friend Annie on it. She's getting a tan. That's on Matane. Um, but that's a funny visual image, and your mind will start to stick with that. Now, it's the same when people meet someone for the first time. Mm. It's the same when someone sees something for the first time. The aesthetics make such a large impact that you don't get the same returns that you would if you spent ma the majority of your time or more of your time on function that you do if you get... Um, more of that on form and aesthetics. So you get a much bigger ROI for it. Um, and more than that, we're big believers that the way something looks is very, very intrinsic to the experience itself. Um, it's why if you walk into somewhere like Gucci or Tiffany's, you've got the actual things that will stand out to you are the fact that there might be a security guard at the door, that the mannequins look different, that the clothes look different, that the store is laid out differently. Now, from a functional perspective, they'd probably make more money if they laid it out in the same way as Tesco did, but that would distract from the experience. Uh, that would, uh, that would, yeah, if they laid it out in the same way, yeah, but that would detract from the aesthetics. And if that detracts from the aesthetics, then suddenly the perception decreases. Um, and like Fabio was saying, even though a website that you've designed can look fantastic, well, can look a bit crappy but function really well, but you've designed it fantastically, the problem is that people aren't going to look and say, this is a really robust website, I can do all that, I can tab to everything, I can't break it, um, it works on every, every browser size, but, you know, they're going to focus on the crap that we need to focus on, like, how tight is the line spacing, um, are the elements pushed far enough away, does everything feel homogenous? Um, so we spend so much of our time on aesthetics because aesthetics make such a massive impact. Yeah. And Apple get away with this, you have to remember. Uh, Apple uh, are very much, they kind of spend a lot of time on function, but nowhere near the aesthetics. They spend most of their time making the uh, 
iOS interfaces look fantastic. They make uh, spend a lot of time product. I mean, admittedly, it's product design, um, making the kind of MacBooks look nice. Yes, and that sells. It sells it because that's kind of what other people see. What and it's a extension of themselves because it's visual. Um, admittedly, when they, when people do make fun functional improvements, it does help. But I suppose if we had to choose, you know, we would definitely. It would be at a push, seventy thirty in favour of aesthetics. Um, and that's just because that's just how humans are. And there's just diminishing returns when you focus too much on function um, in comparison to form. And, you know, we, we're, we're big believers in good, good UX yes. and good function. Um, but you don't need a huge amount to achieve that if you already have kind of the knowledge base. Um, and it's not too hard to learn. And I know that sounds very kind of um, nonchalant, but visual design is so tricky. Like something aesthetically pleasing is very difficult to create. It is, it is difficult, yeah. Um... It's also based on, you know, the brief and whatever. And but yeah, I agree. It, it does. It, I think we we do work mostly on the uh, kind of like visual side. And to be honest, with designers anyway. So mm -hmm. um, we 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 worked with a lot of um, UX designers, for example, where we yeah. were kind of uh, more functional on the, you know on the functional side, mm -hmm. and that makes sense, you know. Um, but at the end of the day, with designers, we want everything to look nice and obviously functional but you know that kind of aesthetic um addition makes a big change you know what's happening we just set this Is place on alarm? fire <laughs> i mean it sounds like an alarm it but does. we're here we've been here the whole time yeah shall i open the door just in case i mean you can open the door <laughs> i don't know what it's gonna do right um, sorry sorry people um i think yeah, we're like, just running off now while we've accidentally set the place on fire. No? Is that going to be a really annoying buzzing noise? Run! <laughs> oh, wait, this, oh, this is oh, is it in the... Oh, what have we done? We're going to have to cut this short now because otherwise everyone's going to have to listen to a stream on, that's just right, actually, alarm city. Well, I mean, I, I can carry on talking. So, yeah, um, apparently we've, we're now intruders in our own office, which is fun. Um, cool, but <laughs> window, use it. Um, but does that does that answer your question, Aaron? In how we kind of work, I know that it's very controversial, um, and it might not be the same way that um, you you might be used to working, or someone else might be. But that's worked for us, um, and it's a solid methodology that kind of you know, if it isn't broken, I'm not going to fix it. Um, but by all means, you tell us we're wrong because we love hearing other sides of the story. We could, you know, if we could get a 10x return from focusing on function instead of form, then we're up for anything. Um, we, we could actually go to the office. There's no... I think, what, how long have we been on the stream? So we've been 50 minutes. 50 minutes. So we could okay. Minutes we could, should we... Uh... Well, we, we could move that way. Uh... Do you think it's still going to make a noise? No, there's no noise. Should we... in the cabinet Okay, there. well, let's just... Hey, they can see a little bit of the... Uh... Do you want to... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, sort of. Sort of, like, wasn't it? was a big like... argument in uni with it. Oh, okay. I mean, you're not, you're not wrong. There's just different approaches, you know? I mean, look at us. Just, this is like a, This is like Cribs now on MTV. Yeah, I mean, you're, not, like you're, a, not, you're, not, you're not wrong by um, any stretch. It's just a different approach. Um, we could sit in the office, yeah? Um, there's a little sign. Is it, is it upside down or backwards? And then there's our learning shelf. There's, there's a lot of wine and, and beer, but we don't really drink, yeah. we don't really drink that. Um, and then some books that we learn. And I was doing some logo work earlier, so inspiration everywhere. Um, cool, should we just yeah, sit so down? We, we sit do, down do a couple of questions. In yeah, there. definitely. Just yeah, this is fun. Call it a day before everyone loses their mind. Yeah, um, especially uh, if we get kicked out of the building for like security what, for, reasons. For breaking in. Yeah, exactly. Jesus. <laughs> okay, so um, any, any more questions? Or should we, should, we, should we waffle on something else and then sign out? Um, yeah, so it's like 10 people watching us, so like, thanks a lot for Should like, we talk, should we, should we um, I suppose if there's no questions, we can talk about what we're doing with Boss here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, kind of to premise uh, everything we've talked about now, if you're interested, um, in the <laughs> <laughs> like, why, why some faces? Um, if you're interested in learning more about uh, UI design and kind of a holistic approach about kind of hacking away at things and um, working in a visually pleasing aesthetic way, 
I'm putting less emphasis on function. But when you say it's the experience it provided in a sense, meaning you said it's an emotional thing, but what that's what gets people to make them part. I was thinking in terms of... Oh, ooh, there is a more... Yeah, see more. This is going to be fun. Oh, that's nice. Oh, oh so I still you, cut it. Mm. Can you think in terms of deco? No. Oh, no. Okay, so when you say the aesthetic experience you provide is functional in a sense, meaning... Yeah, I mean, it, it is. It is, yeah. Um, and that's what we were... I suppose that's kind of the message we're trying to get across in a diluted sort of way. Um... We're big believers that you can't have um, an experience without the aesthetics, which is kind of why we went into the example of like Gucci and Tiffany's. Um, if something isn't visually pleasing, then people aren't, you know, it doesn't, it detracts from the experience. Um, and so ultimately, when you get a lot of people which are self proclaimed UX designers and they don't spend any time on UI, it's very tricky to understand if what they're doing is truly UX. You know, it's kind of one of those um, catch 22 situations that falls on its head a little bit. Um, so yeah, the aesthetically pleasing side makes a massive difference um, to the experience overall. So if something is 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 like fun to use, I mean, so a bin, for example, we've got a really ugly bin in the office because yeah, it they came here. Yeah, they're really ugly. They're really ugly. Now, we don't like using it because it's ugly. Um, it, it it works, but it's ugly. Now we would probably we would spend more money. And this is just us because we're hippies. We'd spend more money on a nice bin, which wouldn't have it, which wouldn't, which a function wouldn't change in any way. But the way we interact with it and the value we would get from that product would feel like it's more because it's aesthetically pleasing. And it kind of fits with... Uh, bear in mind that a good, a good person to read into this was Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays um, talk, created the American dream and consumerism. And he created the idea that possessions were an extension of, themsel- of someone. So when you buy something, it's an extension of yourself. It's not really. You know, you're still you, even if you don't have an iPhone, a shirt, and um, a pair of sunglasses. But you feel like it's an extension of you. So by having a nice looking bin, it would be an extension of me and Fabio. Um, hey Tom. Hey Tom, yeah, we're going <laughs> to sign off soon. Uh, if we had a nice bin, it would be an extension of me and Fabio. So, you know, in consumerist nature, we, you know, the aesthetics extend from us. You know, you buy nice clothes because they suit you. Um, I say most of you either don't come to the front of the day, in my opinion. Where is the text such content and it's easy to consume is the most part? Typography makes a very big difference. It does make a big difference. It um, makes a big difference in graphic design. Th- I was going to say, there is a, uh, it depends on the context. Yeah. Like, it depends on what project you're working on. Mm. Uh, sometimes you're restricted as well. Yes. Maybe not so much nowadays, yeah. but you used to be. I suppose um, you can, any typography can look good uh, as long as you can use it in the right way. So even Comic Sans looks great in the right places. <laughs> I mean, people give it a lot of stick, but it's a nice font. It's out of context. Most it's out of context, yeah. yeah. It's like Open Sans will look like crap if you put it on a dinner menu. It's not designed to be sat there, kind of like uh, used in print, really. It's like, it's like a web font, isn't it? Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly, um, so... Um, yeah, the, there is, although there is a kind of crossover um, recently, and we were talking mm. at the beginning of the video, it was uh, when we were saying about kind of like 60 design, yeah. where there is a lot of like cr- crossover from uh, print design into mm-hmm. digital design. And mm, yeah, the uh, actual fonts do make, uh, topography makes a lot of... Uh, yeah, difference. I definitely agree with uh, content. So content, the power of words, um, as long as they're reinforced with visual images or they can create visual images in someone's yeah. head is incredible. You can never stop that. I mean, freaking Donald Trump managed to win the US presidency by using words, which says a lot because he is yeah. neither aesthetically pleasing or morally pleasing. Don't go into politics. Uh, yeah, oh. but he, he did so because his words were very good. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people that have managed to get into power and do crazy things have done so because the words are good. You know, you buy things because of words really more than anything else. Um, if you're listening to the radio and something, <laughs> if you're listening to the radio and someone makes you buy something, um, it's not because, you know, it's, you can see it and it's an extension of yourself and it's aesthetically pleasing. It's because freaking the words are really good. So if you want a good lesson on selling to people with words, listen to the radio um, or ultimately read something by David Ogilvy. Um, he writes a lot of cool things. Um, yeah. The Boron letters are really good for learning about yeah. words. But content is very important. And then if that content is presented nicely, it's even more important. I've seen people on Medium write articles that aren't... Um, medium famous I mean that's a terrible example but they have got maybe sub 1000 followers for example and they can write something with no images nothing else just really good content and it will go viral um, so yeah text makes a big difference um, what would you say the biggest difference for mobile design patterns between teenagers and other people I've got a project coming up with teens and they seem to hard in terms of aesthetics um, uh, it is tricky. I mean, there is a good example, which was Snapchat. Snapchat is a really yeah. good example. Just um, look at... I mean, the easiest way to see what people are expecting in terms of aesthetics is to look 
at the apps they're already using. If they're millennials, yeah. uh, they're all teenagers. They're likely to be using Snapchat. They're likely to be using Instagram. They're likely yeah. to be using Facebook. And although they're not the most visually pleasing examples, you can go deeper. So if someone uses Instagram, see what the recommended apps are on the App Store or the recommended apps to complement Instagram on Google. Is that like VSCO? Um, is it uh, Enlight? Is it those kind of apps? Because once you know what they're using, you know what their expectations are. Because if you're designing something, um, for example, we designed and we're building and a, at the moment, which is coming to, a, uh, coming to the point where it's live, like a, a competitor for Airbnb for a client. Like it's tricky to do because Airbnb looks great. Um, but we, so we know someone's minimum expectations, basically. Um, and that's the kind of thing. If you know what the users you're using, uh, what the minimum expectations for the app that they're or, or the product that they're using are, then you can design with that in mind and you can design better, which is the important thing. So look at what they're using. Well, what do you, when, do you, when, well, when do you meet expectations and when do you exit surprises and exceed them? them? Well, if you're designing for a client, like, did you, do you, if you, the easiest way is to create something like a mood board in advance and show them that. So how do you, you find out how they think, tease out their images, tease out the, what they want, because you have to impress the client, then look at what apps teenagers are going to be using, um, find the best looking ones, put them together, and then send them across. I mean, in like terms in terms of the, of the user. user. I feel... Okay, loads of questions, I love this. Um, okay. So let, let's reply to that. So in terms of the user, okay. In terms of the user, so I feel that... Um, Surprise them is always by creating crazy kind of things. Yeah, Instagram surprised a lot of people. Is Not it, Instagram, uh, yeah, Snapchat. Snapchat sorry, because like yeah. the, the, the the interface is so like different from anything else, and um, I feel that you should just go out there and create something completely different. And I know it, it is tricky, and it would be tricky for us to do as well. Yeah. But. Um, yeah, definitely look at the trends. Just, yeah, break the rules. And break the rules, yeah, you know, exactly. There is nothing um, to say. Even iOS, this is the thing that a lot of people get hung up on. Um, people look at iOS human interface guidelines and they use it like a freaking Bible. No, I agree. That's... It's, any, any developer can develop anything. Um, as long as it doesn't use Android patterns and it doesn't use uh, anything that doesn't exist within the iPhone context already, you can pretty much do almost anything. Um as long as you don't need to access like the super secret Apple like repos that you don't get access to, then you can do whatever you want. So, go be if you want to if you want to exceed the expectations of a user, then make something so damn beautiful and so weird that they it, can't yeah. stop talking about it. You yeah. know, if someone doesn't like something at first, that's not necessarily a bad thing. No, I, I feel the, the the weirdness part of it is quite important as well. I think so, yeah. You know, because uh, it could be something that is unexpected mm. from any apps really, and when you see like. An app that's a bit weird, a bit like or mega colorful or like unusual animations or things. Even uh, Visco uh, used like did a few redesigns. Which oh, like, Visco redesigns are completely. You know, I can't. Say they look nice. They look nice, but they really do throw a function into the they window. Do. Yeah, they? exactly. But they it works. Really people talk about it. The right. amount of people, designers especially, that take photos. The amount of people that hated on Visco. Yes. But that made me download it because yeah, I was exactly. like, oh, I have to look at this. I don't even take a lot of pictures, but yeah. I have to look at this. Yeah, and, uh, and I haven't deleted the app, and I've only got like, twelve apps on my phone. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly, um, and and that yeah, that's that's the thing. So it tries to be a little bit different, um, kind of understand the guidelines, but don't follow them at all. Um, just I, that's my opinion anyway. Yeah. Uh, just understand the basics. Also, there was uh, one from okay, Tom. Cool. We'll no, one from, from Mario. From, okay. from Mario, what makes UI or UX addictive? A platform like Facebook or oh, okay, cool. There's to tons of uh, interesting science about um, what makes apps addictive. Um, and there's a lot of good books that explain this much better than we could. Yeah. Um, I'd highly recommend um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. It goes into kind of uh, really, really heavy uh, cognitive psychology and you understand why people tick and think the way they do. Um, also, there's Hooked by Nur Eyal. Hooked is really good. Hooked by Nur Eyal yeah. is a very, very good one. There's Drunk Tank Pink by Adam Altessier, is it? Yeah, there is a brain as well, you've been reading. Um, yeah. It's kind of not so much about, um, you know, like design or anything mm. like that. It's understanding the brain yeah, and yeah. how it works, and it's by uh, David Eggleman, I think, or okay. Eggleman or something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's really, it's I mean, really we can good. We can just share um, reading this with people. We could actually do that, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Oh, I, think, yeah. but I suppose, uh, what, but the easiest way to look at what makes UI UX addictive is when people talk about gamification and they talk about patterns and they talk about everything in between, 
people focus far too much on on that but they don't look at the level above that so what are patterns creating what are um like what's gamification creating it's creating habits so ultimately to create something addictive you have to make it a habit so people check facebook every day now because it's a habit people check snapchat every day because it's a habit and so on and so forth it's creating that habit so you have to understand how the brain works how habits are formed and what you can do to make it that happen so and the really really simple level habits are created because someone continues to repeat an action and they continue to repeat an action subconsciously um, so you have to keep bring people I mean and the only way to make someone create do an action subconsciously that isn't breathing eating or you know uh, they have to be brought or be taught or given that action over and over again. And that's why push notifications work. There's a reason I have all my push notifications turned off. And it's because if I did everything every app wanted me to do, I wouldn't even get out of bed. I kind of <laughs> just sit there playing with apps. Um, but it's those sorts of things. So make people come back. Make people want to come back. There's a reason why apps have streaks and bonuses. And if you use Memrise or Geolingo, it rewards you for logging in every day. You do that for 30 days, you have a habit. You do that for 60 days, you no longer have a have habit, you have a belief. You believe you have to log into Duolingo every day for 60, day, 60 days. Also, when you get to that stage, other psycho like psychological techniques start to kick in, like the sunk cost effect. And that means people stay involved with their pro Apple product or anything else that they've sunk a lot of time into. So if you have sunk 300 hours into Clash of Clans, nothing on the planet apart from your phone setting on fire or you know something bad happening to you is going to stop you playing Clash of Clans because it, you've got sunk cost, the sunk cost fallacy. The same with gamblers. Gamblers put in 3, 3K into something and they turn around and they're like, oh, I'm going to keep putting money in to win. They don't see the, the loss. They see the gain in the future, which... You know, once you get someone to that stage, then you've, they've got an addictive habit, an addictive app, and they're going to use it forever. Which is why UI design is kind of dangerous, because you have to make sure you're working on the right things. Because you can quite easily change someone's life in a good way, or you can ruin it. So just make sure that if you're creating something addictive, that what you're creating is fruits and vegetables and not cocaine. That's kind of... It's, uh, that's yeah. that's yeah, the way I look at it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah? absolutely. Okay. I love that, yeah. Um... Excuse my massive finger there. It's alright, Troy, yeah, have a little. So, so that's what's your go-to software for developing and designing apps from concept to actually making it functional, pushing it live? Ah, this, one's, this one is uh, super simple. Super simple so, because we use mostly just one software. Yeah. Uh, well, two really. Um, but we've been experimenting. So we experiment mm. with lots of software, but yeah. we we massive Sketch fans. Yeah, Sketch is super um, fast, super lightweight. Yeah, exactly. So we'll design anything that doesn't require photo editing or heavy vector work in Sketch. If we need to do illustrations, we'll be an illustrator. If we need to do photo editing or like some weird shadow effects that Sketch doesn't like, then we'll throw that into yeah. Photoshop. Because you did a lot of Riot Games and stuff in Photoshop, didn't you? Because yeah. Because it was like really steampunky. Exactly, yeah. The steampunky stuff was very uh, kind of like uh, image heavy. And I feel that Sketch is a little bit uh, underpowered for that. Yeah. Um, and also, um, but we tend to, to be quite flexible in, mm. about the tools that we use. Yeah. So we've been trying Figma, uh, which is really good. Um, but it still feels a little bit weird because it's like, it's a web-based tool, um, and sometimes it just feels not quite there. Mm. And I've been using uh, XD as well, so yeah. Adobe uh, XD, XD is nice. Yeah, XD is nice. So I love some of the facts that uh, they they do. So some some of the things they implemented really well, like the pattern creation, uh, the built-in um, prototyping mm -hmm. tools. Those are really really spot on, and the um, and it's quite stable. Like it, I never managed to crash the app. Like creating nice. like we you know things layers and designs. See, and and you can say something nice about Adobe XD without being paid to say. Yeah, it. exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, cool. So, um, I suppose yeah. yeah. So I suppose if we had to give a, a so go to software for designing. So from from so go to software for mood boarding um, would be kind of Envision. We just tend to throw mood boards on Envision. Um, and that's the first stage before we do anything else. We send mood boards to clients to get their thoughts on kind of the direction that they want. For design, for wireframing and actual visual design, we use Sketch. Um, there's some edge cases, but it's mostly Sketch. Um, and then for developing, we'll if it's web, then we can just use, use freaking uh, Sublime Text and just start Sublime Text. Just use Sublime Text to start coding things out. If yeah. you're not super web-minded or dev-minded, Webflow is super super cool, flexible, and scalable. For yeah, you. Webflow is quite cool. Yeah, uh, I've never had a chance of like. 
creating something yeah. in it. Uh, but yeah. I've heard, like, yeah. I've Webflow is really good. So if yeah. you want something that, that's bigger than yourself and it's not on Squarespace or WordPress, then Webflow could actually work really, really nicely. Yeah. Um, but we'll tend to code things out on the web, especially by hand, because it's easy to do. Um, for app stuff, we could do native. Um, we rarely do. We, we usually do hybrid stuff. So we use a framework like Xamarin or React. Um, but it's getting kind of techy and no one's really interested here. Um, <laughs> oh, there might be, eh? There might be, yeah. Really hey, yeah, if anyone wants to have a, a dev conversation, then yeah, we, we can get geeky yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. That's fun, isn't it? Yeah. It's not. Uh, so um, Tom, and his principal and sketch. sketch. Yeah, yeah the, that's it. Good. Principal um, is a great prototype. I, I love you like. uh, Flinto more Flinto, than Flinto, principal, yeah. mostly because the uh, kind of the way that you can do, so the, the way the interface is designed, I, I feel it's a little more, a bit more logical than mm -hmm. the principal. Um, instead of having like the massive stack of screens one next to the other, yeah. you can actually uh, um, move them around a little bit like Sketch. Mm -hmm. uh, is, I think the learning curve is a little bit steeper than principal, but the results are kind of like on par and are quite good. Cool, perfect. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess, in, uh, what's wrong with my voice? Uh, I guess if um, <laughs> no one else has any questions. Yeah, uh, you can, can do crazy can stuff in principle. Yeah, I mean, no, that's true. there's a. I know a, a few very famous um, designers um, working with some of the biggest studios in the world that swear only by principle, um, and they've created like, you know, mockups for Snapchat and like similar companies. Yeah, so. even Apple, they do use internal. Yeah, they use, they use principle. Yeah. It's good. Um, we've got no qualms with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, if there's no more questions, then we'll do. We'll, we'll like gently talk plug, a little bit. We'll just do gen yeah. gently plug boss. Yeah. Um, which is the free UI design tool we've created, which is all it, yeah. is, all it does is send you weekly briefs with all of our source files um, to kind of learn more UI design. It's really holistic, you just hack at things. Um, so you get a brief with all the art direction, all the heavy lifting. Uh, all you have to do is create some concepts, share them with friends. If you send them to us, we'll give you feedback on them for free as well. Um, doesn't Like I said, it's we just want to do something nice for everyone. So Vostia yeah, doesn't make any money at the moment. Um, we just teach people cool UI design stuff, give feedback, you know, all the feedback comes from myself or Fabio. Um, we give you our source files, which we want you to steal. Please use it for client work. Please reskin it, repurpose it, and make some money off of it, because we don't, and it does take hours to do still. <laughs> um, so use it as much as you can. Um, if nothing else, sign up, because once you sign up, you get all the free source files. Um, we've got a collab with Opera, which is launching at the end of this week. Yeah, that's um, op And Opera um, are doing some cool stuff with design at the moment. So it'll be fucking good. It'll be a good challenge for some people, yeah, especially definitely. if you're not actually a UI designer. That's the cool thing, is if you're a cool illustrator or you've got a background in graphic design, you get a lot from it as well. Um, what's it called again? Oh, Vossier. I, I can type it in the yeah, chat. Yeah, you should be able to because, the uh, message. Yeah. Oh, I've got the, the Italian this keyboard. Is, I'm basically going to correct it or something. This like. is, please. Oh, you go. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's called Vossier. Uh, the yeah, that's the blue one. Yeah, in there. Dot, hang on, com. So if I just send that there. So yeah, so okay. just that's it. Yeah. Um, like I said, please go on there and steal all of our source files and use them for client work because we can't. Because <laughs> we've given them away to you. Steal them, repurpose them, like hack away at them. It's a nice gesture. Um, and we're going to be producing some UI kits and other bits and pieces. We're tempted to do a course as well. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it would be great to hear from, from the yeah, guys. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to use this as market research. No, 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 but, absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, um, but yeah, I guess, this, this is the last call. Uh, any more, if there's no more questions, you've got, you've got a few comments. 50 comments, 50 comments that's yeah, nice. Yeah, 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 that's quite nice. I well, so, that's so. Nice. Um, this was only meant to be half an hour. How long has it been? Uh, it's uh, an, an hour, hour and ten, ten minutes. minutes. Yeah. I'm so, I'm so sorry if I, we just bored everyone with our boring talk. Yeah, I um, mean... Uh, Look at doing some polls. Yeah, yeah I mean, that'll be cool. Yeah. That'll be cool. Uh, we'll look at that in the future, I guess. Um, um, but no, yeah, so I mean, actually, one thing before we go, uh, if there's anything that we could do to help any of you, um, whether that's feedback, whether that's kind of um, doing another anything else like this, then let, let us know because we're so happy to give back. Um, you know, we're lucky that we are where we are. We're lucky that we've got a team and we've worked really hard. We've, you know, we've worked hard. We've got, we're, as much as anything else, like working hard brings you luck and we've been lucky and we're happy yeah. for it. So we kind of want to share as much as we can so that you guys can be lucky and have a good life and design pretty things. I know? think it's most of yeah, design, design yeah. things and uh, design, the, the freedom, keyword like, is design pretty things. Design you know, pretty that's, things, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's the Fabio style. <laughs> um, yeah, always, yeah. But yeah, no, it's, it's been cool. Um, if, if there's any other questions, then just, uh, or anything else anyone wants to know or see, then tag uh, either 
myself or Fabio in the comments on this with some questions and we'll probably go grab some food and... Do you like Dunn and Raby? Who? What is that? I don't know. Sorry, David. Sorry, uh, David, I've, I've no idea. No, I no idea. Um, I mean, send us a link, we'll have a look at it, as long yeah. as it's not rude, it's safe for work. <laughs> yeah. um, if we can save it, yeah, go, uh, go crazy. Apparently we could, yeah, when he finishes, I think he will ask. Oh, he'll ask us to save, yeah, yeah, cool, well, we'll save it, and then... Um, we can definitely share it again. We'll share, share it again, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, but if this stays live, then just, like, you know, I mean, you can add, add my, me or Fabio's friends, and we can chat and help each other out, but I mean, yeah, ultimately, if you need anything quick, just tag us in a yeah, comment. Yeah, we can be another five minutes or yeah, so. Yeah, just be like, at Cassius or at Fabio, uh, and one of us can answer something, hopefully, you know, um, but we just need to get some food now, and... I need to finish doing these logos. I've got I've done two of twenty concepts and it's eight ten past eight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's been a long day for you as well. Lots of driving as well. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, right. Um, I guess yeah. yeah. I guess it's us signing out. Yeah. I guess it is. Um, there's no more questions cool. or anything like that. No, we get like one minute, guys. Just young girls. Like guys. one minute. <laughs> um, That's why I I always say team because team. I think guys is. Um, it's kind of like I don't uh, think it's very. I do, yeah, it feels a bit too masculine. Biased, masculine, it? yeah. yeah. It, it, but then team yeah. sounds like everyone's like working for. This has been amazing. Oh, Aaron, thank you. Oh, thanks, Aaron. Yeah, like, thanks a lot. It's very sweet. Um, I'm sure we're not that nice. I mean, I like to think that everyone's the same as us, really. Yeah, you know? I agree. Um, yeah, I, I I just feel like we are a good team because of like our expertise and things that we can do uh, together, um, and I think that's the most important thing. It's just like. It's how marriage starts this time, though. You've got to watch your words. <laughs> oh. All right. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, cool. Uh, cool, I guess we'll finish it. All right. Yeah. Take care, guys. Uh, that was fun. I yeah. hope you've got a load of value out of this. Um, if there's anything else we can do, just let us know. You know. Definitely, yeah. Cool, cool. Perfect. So I'll just say, finish button. <laughs>